Well, welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed your lunch and you're ready for more. Uh, the first thing I need to tell you is that uh, one or two of our sessions will involve uh, languages other than English, notably Spanish on this occasion. Uh, you all have uh, interpreting uh, devices on your desks. Very straightforward. Uh, as you'll see, the panel on the desk itself is how you find your language and work out the volume. So uh, you might need that at uh, various points through the course of the forum. I should also point out that I made a mistake at the end of our morning session and uh, suggested the wrong session was starting now, so let me make that completely clear. This is the session, and it's about the autonomy of sport, a contemporary perspective from governments and the European Union. And I'm delighted to uh, uh, hand over to my colleague, Gerardo Riquelme, who is the sub-director of Marca, who will be marshalling us through this uh, panel session. Gerardo. Hello. Sir? Uh, hello, David. Hello, Mr. President. Hello, all the stakeholders that represent the guardians of the pure spirit of sport. Uh, the goal of sport has traditionally been regulated through a self-governing tools that build its own regulations, laws, and rules. Outside and inside the pitch, we found different examples of that, like the key form of organization that have the federations, the limits in the Bosman case, or the transfer rules. Governments and European Union institutions agree and spare this autonomy, although has never been unconditional. As Emmanuel said this morning, we saw in these days controversies and incidents related to money laundering, tax evasion, match fixing, and other rejected practice. So do governments and European Union institutions still think the same way? Should we treat like other sectors? Today, we have the privilege of share a values minutes with three of the most wise people in this topic. Without any delay, I'm going to introduce the, these men. First of all, I introduce the Right Honourable Richard Cayborn, former Minister of Sport of the United Kingdom from 2001 to 2007, and now Member of Parliament for Sheffield Central and the Government Representative of the Football Foundation Board. My, Mr. Cayborn, it's your turn. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. And uh, can I say uh, to uh, the ICSS and, and indeed Fitz, th thanks for this forum, because I think it fits very well uh, with the title of, of this session, which... Uh, uh, as just been says, the autonomy of sport, a contemporary perspective. And I don't think you could get it more accurate than that, because I think what's been happening in sport, and it was a very good discussion this morning, and the autonomy of sport was actually uh, referred to on a number of occasions. And I think one ought to, first of all, qual qualify what the autonomy of sport is from, I think, from an ex-minister's perspective, and indeed, when I was a minister, and it was the autonomy of sport had to work within the broad public policies. It wasn't that you gave carte blanche and it just did what it wanted to. In sport, that would have been wrong, uh, and that's why we had strong, strong public policy. But I do believe there's an absolutely fundamental principle that sport ought to be taking the lead, and it is for other institutions, including government, to support that. And if I can give one very good example of why the WADA code came into operation as quickly as it did, is because there was a number of sports ministers who were able to back WADA and the code, and we did it by saying that any, and I was one of those as a minister, and said that if any of the governing bodies of sport within the United Kingdom did not sign up to the WADA code, then they got no public money. Now, I don't, whether that was an intervention or whether it was affecting the autonomy of sport, I don't know, but I believe, as a minister of sport, I had a responsibility for the people in the UK that the sport was clean and that was an action and many of us took that action and I believe that then came, what came from that was the fastest convention that went onto the uh, UNESCO's books that there's been and that is now operational now with its strengths and its weaknesses. But I think from those days to where we are now and just think what's happened in sport in this less than a decade when people genuinely are trying now to address these big issues of credibility and the integrity of sport. In part, I think that started at Salt Lake, the Olympics of Salt Lake, and I think what Rog did when he came in as president of the IOC, 
has now carried on with what Bach's doing on his Agenda 2020, is seriously addressing the question of the integrity of that organisation. I think in this last period, what you've seen in cycling, and that's changed, and again, that was elected on a change agenda, a fundamental change of agenda. You saw what's happened to the IWF, IWAF in the last few weeks. Again, there were manifestos out from those that were running, and I believe that both of those candidates were for a changed agenda. If you saw what happened this week at the Commonwealth Games Federation, where Louise Martin has been elected as new president, again on a change agenda. If you look what's happening in snooker, and so it can go on. But what is driving that change, I think, is, and the whole question of where does that autonomy of sport fit within that, I think, is, is the crucial question. And I think part of that's been touched on, touched, on, touched on this morning. But I think if you look at what's happening in FIFA now, and there's a lot of skepticism around, and I think that's probably with some justification. But I think what we have seen around FIFA, the fact that they are where they are at the moment, where the president has resigned, and where there is now a fundamental debate taking place about the role of FIFA, is not just governments pushing that. And there's no doubt, I was to say, as a minister of sport, if sport ever went off the back page onto the front page, I was in trouble with the prime minister. Because the prime minister always informed me if sport ever got onto the front page. Because invariably, when sport goes on the front page, it's on the front page for all the worst reasons. And therefore, your boss starts getting a bit concerned. And that's what used to happen. I'm sure that's true about many other sports ministers. I don't my colleague uh, from Spain may well be able to answer that differently. But I think that this, the, the, this agenda now for change is there. And FIFA, I've got to respond to that. Because I believe the sponsors, I believe the television, and as important of all, the fans themselves, are demanding there's got to be that fundamental change. And just in concluding this little bit of it, I think that's where this debate, this discussion takes place, because again, it was touched on this morning. And it's a big question that's always asked, and I used to ask this as a sports minister. Who regulates the international governing bodies? Who actually sets the standards for international governing bodies? And when you stand back from that, it's a vacuum. There is nothing there other than what people talk, and that's why I think this debate that's starting today, and thanks to Banyu uh, and to Hamid, that this is really, I think, could be the outcome of setting those benchmarks, the international benchmarks, which need to be actually uh, at least attained if there is going to be credibility in sport, and they then ought to be the touchstone for people who are going to invest, who are going to televise them, and who are going to support them. So I think that's the big question. But I think I'm not pessimistic, I'm fairly optimistic, that I think change is in the air, and I think that's been brought about by a movement of many forces who want to see sport as the great thing it is, the great deliverer of that as well. So I think that in terms of the autonomy, I just want at some stage, if I can, just to touch on this question of the European Union and the role it plays uh, within that as well. That's probably a little bit later on in the discussion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cable, for this very interesting presentation. And now we have the privilege to hear Mr. Antonio Silva Mendes, that is the Director of Sport and Youth of the European Commission. Since the beginning of this year, Mr. Silva is the leadership to project the potential of young people in sport in European dimension. And he has a huge experience in this field. He is that we say in football, one, one man club. Uh, he is 26 years in European institutions. Congratulations for this record. And, well, it's your turn. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, EACSS, uh, for organizing this event and for the opportunity of that. Because, it's, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Richard was uh, saying, the opportunity of this is because we are in a moment, in a turning moment. Uh, for the first time at the European level, we have the sports has an article uh, of the Treaty of Lisbon. We have sports in the, in, in the portfolio of our commissioner. The commissioner Navracic is responsible for, for, uh, for sports, for education, youth, uh, culture, and sports is e essentially mentioned. So we have, uh, and we had uh, uh, last, uh, last June, a recommendation from, uh, from the, the European Parliament to encourage member states and the European Commission to act. But here is the case. Do we act in a mandatory level, as it was uh, uh, in the air this, uh, this morning, or should we intervene in a different way? The answer is in the article uh, of the treaty. We will not 
intend at all to intervene in a legal, in a legal manner. We will not probably have a regulation on this because we don't believe that this is the right solution. On the contrary, we have other opportunities. We have, uh, and the, 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 the treaty is very clear, we have to support the fairness, the openness uh, of, uh, of sport. But we have to respect the voluntary basis of this. And we have also to respect the subsidiarity principle, because this is also something this comes under the, 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 the member states' responsibility. So we want, we have to intervene, we have the obligation to intervene, and we are intervening already in pushing, in putting in place a number of uh, expert groups discussing good governance, and we, in the last uh, period we have already identified the different principles of the good governance which are there. Now we have experts groups trying to identify how do we implement. We believe this is the right way. And one of the ways we believe we can do is by encouraging the peer pressure, uh, a sort of uh, a self-declaration of the good principles implementation by the public or by the sports organizations, creating a sort, let's imagine, a pledge board where these entities will put in place and present their commitment. Uh, as it was mentioned this morning, why not to encourage these organizations to present in the internet the accounts? It would be a good example of the way to proceed. So we, we believe we are in a moment of change. We have all collectively to contribute, but we have also to pay attention to the diversity of the reality that we are facing. We are facing big organizations, we are facing UEFA, FIFA, with a big dimension, but we have also an obligation to face with the small clubs, the small organizations, and this is where we have also to intervene. So these are elements that we are imagining, we are putting in place with member states, with governments, with expert groups, with associations, with ECSS also, how can we go forward in implementing a mechanism through what we can be more transparent, more accountable, because accountability, as it was also mentioned this morning, is a relevant uh, element of, uh, of this transparency game. So these are some elements and uh, some, some words, and we will be ready to discuss further. Thank you, Mr. Silva. Um, finally, it's an honor for me to introduce my countryman, Miguel, Miguel Cardenal, the Higher Council for Sports in Spain since the beginning of 2012. He's a brave man, a brave lawyer, professor of labor at University of Extremadura, a long career in disciplinary bodies in sports, including the International Council of Arbitration of Sports. Uh, and Miguel, uh, we have a fantastic uh, translators in the room, and it's very odd for me to speak with you in English, so I prefer that you speak in Spanish. <laughs> pues, eh, como, muchas gracias, eh, Gerardo, por la introducción. Muchas gracias por la invitación para estar hoy aquí en este eh, seminario y felicidades a la organización por haberlo llevado a cabo. ¿no? Eh, si me hay algún periodista español, esto les pido que por favor no me lo tomen en cuenta. Si me permiten una broma, eh, podría ser quien con más propiedad podría referirme hoy a este tema porque en el tiempo que llevo en el gobierno de España a cargo del deporte, he tenido varias denuncias de asociaciones, de federaciones de mi país, ante sus federaciones internacionales, acusándome de no respetar su autonomía y de llevar a cabo eh, injerencias. Y quería empezar recordando que eh, la, el, el problema de la autonomía en el deporte obedece a unos orígenes históricos que no podemos olvidar y que eh, los problemas que hoy tenemos y que nos llevan ocupando a lo largo de esta mañana son muy distintos de los que hemos sufrido en el pasado, pero no debemos olvidarlos. No todo el mundo es Suiza, no todo el mundo es eh, Europa Occidental y lo que eh, es una gran amenaza y es una amenaza que siempre existirá es el intento de utilización del deporte, de convertirlo en un medio por parte del poder y del poder político. Nosotros en España eh, sufrimos una dictadura de cuatro décadas, no hace tanto tiempo, y durante la misma hubo un uso eh, del deporte político que no nos puede ser ajeno. 
Y es una amenaza que hoy día, que tenemos un régimen eh, magnífico de libertades, sigue presente en nuestro país. Tenemos conflictos en los que aparece un intento de uso político del deporte de nuevo y que han estado en los medios de comunicación de manera muy reciente. De forma que creo que eh, la defensa de la autonomía del deporte debe ser un principio que todos los gobiernos eh, debemos sostener. El deporte ha pedido esa autonomía y la ha reclamado en términos eh, tan eh, casi a veces exagerados como vemos, porque eh, lo que ha habido que sufrir y los riesgos que existen y siguen existiendo en tantos eh, lugares del mundo son unos riesgos importantes. Ahora vemos en el otro lado del péndulo eh, que esa autonomía también puede presentar eh, problemas de otra naturaleza. Y, insisto, yo en, eh, me podría poner eh, como ejemplo de lo que creo que en un acercamiento de los gobiernos tiene que ser eh, mantener unos principios firmes frente a estas organizaciones deportivas para que, y voy a coincidir con algunas de las apreciaciones que se han hecho ya hoy aquí por mis compañeros de panel y en el anterior panel, para que no sea, tenía la misma palabra que se ha utilizado esta mañana, un escudo protector eh, frente a eh, aspectos que no se deben eh, consentir. Me gustaría señalar también que, en mi opinión, el mundo del deporte, y también se ha hablado sobre ello, no es distinto. Los problemas que hay de corrupción son problemas que se presentan en el ámbito de la política, en el ámbito de la eh, actividad económica. Y, como digo, lo, lo es un tema sobre el que he reflexionado bastante, porque en mi mandato, ya casi cuatro años en el Gobierno de España, pues, eh, he tocado con esta cuestión en varias veces. Les voy a poner algunos ejemplos. Eh, la Federación de Fútbol de mi país eh, aprobamos una norma mediante la cual exigimos un mínimo de mujeres en los órganos directivos. La Federación de Fútbol de España tiene prácticamente 70 miembros en su board, en su junta directiva. Hay una mujer. La Federación Española de Fútbol considera que eso es una injerencia inaceptable en su eh, autonomía. Bueno, y, y estos son el tipo de casos con los que me he venido enfrentando a lo largo de estos años. Pero creo que eh, el acercamiento parcial que plantea también esta, este encuentro con temas distintos es un acercamiento muy interesante porque son temas que requieren una aproximación individualizada, el lavado de dinero, el respeto a los derechos de las personas, de los trabajadores y los TPO, todos estos temas que nos plantean. Pero yo creo, y es la convicción que quería trasladarles hoy, que hay un sustrato común, una clave común de la que también se ha eh, hablado esta mañana. Para mí, el aspecto esencial que un gobierno debe controlar eh, y debe favorecer y promover en las federaciones deportivas, en las organizaciones deportivas, es la democracia interna. Eh, creo que es eh, la clave para que todo lo demás eh, funcione, porque... Detrás de todos los problemas que yo he tenido en este ámbito, con también por ejemplo la Federación de Tenis, lo que hay son estructuras creadas para mantener el poder, que llevan a eh, que no se quiera ejercer una vigilancia o un control sobre los integrantes de esa organización, siempre que a cambio de eso se reciba el soporte para la reelección en varios mandatos. Yo creo que si no eh, reconocemos este problema, eh, estamos ciegos ante la realidad. No hay ningún ámbito de las organizaciones eh, del género que sea en el que los directivos tengan una eh, longevidad como la que aparece en el ámbito del deporte. Aquí se ha hablado también de limitación de mandatos. Pero yo creo que lo que explica esto es simplemente las enormes carencias de democracia interna que existen en las organizaciones deportivas. Y es algo que no está en la agenda, en, no es una prioridad para ninguna organización deportiva internacional. En muchas de ellas incluso se reconoce explícitamente que no se eh, mantienen esos, esos principios, empezando eh, por el propio Comité Olímpico Internacional, que en la designación de sus miembros no obedecen en absoluto a un principio democrático y lo, lo justifican y lo defienden a su manera. A mí me parece que... Eh, lo que hemos visto en FIFA, por ejemplo, eh, y lo que vemos en estas organizaciones tiene este principio. Hablaba Daniel antes de la situación en Sudamérica, 
Si en FIFA no se ha querido saber lo que sucedía en Sudamérica es porque eh, lo que estaba en juego ahí era el apoyo en los siguientes eh, ámbitos electorales. No porque esas personas que estaban en la administración de FIFA tuvieran necesariamente que compartir o incluso que beneficiarse de esas eh, actividades que se llevan a cabo. Por eso, insisto, los gobiernos creo que debemos apostar por esa autonomía, que la debemos reforzar, que la debemos fortalecer, pero lo que tenemos que pedir a cambio es que se compartan los valores, al final, si hablamos de un país europeo occidental, los valores que tenemos. Si me permiten, y acabo ya, eh, luego podemos hablar de otras cosas, me gustaría hacer una comparación con un fenómeno que está muy de actualidad en Europa, desgraciadamente, el tema de la inmigración, donde estamos siendo completamente incapaces de estar a la altura de los retos que nos plantean. Pero en el tema de la inmigración, a quien viene a nuestra sociedad, la recibimos como tiene que ser, con la eh, dignidad que merece cualquier persona, pero le exigimos que respete nuestros principios, nuestros valores. Estas organizaciones deportivas, en base a la autonomía, lo que no pueden hacer es despreciar lo que son nuestros valores de convivencia mínimos compartidos. Y entre ellos está el tener un sistema de democracia, que nos lo exigimos para los partidos políticos, nos lo exigimos en nuestras constituciones para los sindicatos, lo exigimos en las leyes de asociaciones. Pues tiene que haber una auténtica democracia que no consiste exclusivamente en la elección mediante votos, consiste en una verdadera cultura de participación democrática. Porque un sistema democrático permitiría que esa autonomía fuera al mismo tiempo el mejor recurso, la mejor arma para que desde dentro de la propia organización se evitaran todos estos problemas que aquí se están planteando. Eh, gracias, Miguel. Eh, iniciamos el turno de, de preguntas. Me gustaría conocer eh, si no piensan que el deporte no está suficientemente maduro para tener autonomía propia, viendo las, los casos que hemos visto durante toda esta mañana y todos los casos que hemos conocido en estos últimos años. I think the answer to that is a yes and a no, to be quite honest. In some organizations, yes, it is. Uh, and I think we've just got to take, take, take a, a view of sport. It's not just about professional sport. Uh, and and I, uh, my colleague from Spain and myself, when I was a minister, we looked at, after sport. And probably 90% of sport that's played in a nation is at the amateur level, it's at the school level, it's not at the professional level. And we're talking about here about possibly about 10% of that sports activity. And I think what we found, and I found this as a minister, that the question of the governance of sport in some of them, uh, some of the sports, was very weak indeed. And in fact, if I give you the example of some of my colleagues in this room uh, who were pushing back a little bit when I did it, but I asked as a minister of sport to have the English Football Association uh, reviewed. And that's when we were pushed back as a government, but I insisted that we ought to have non-executive directors on there. I insisted that we ought to have a non-executive chair for the Football Association, and that's what's happened. But equally so what's happened in English football, which is quite an interesting model to look at. Because of the European Union giving a sport, which is not a business, it's a sport, dispensation to operate as a cartel, and that's indeed what the Premier League is, the richest league in the world, And in a space of, what, just over a decade, it's gone, probably one and a half decades now, it's gone from an organisation that was turning over very little in terms of revenues from television. The last deal that's been done is for eight billion pounds for three years for 20 football clubs. Now, the reason they've been able to do that is because my colleagues in the European Union Commission gave football, and not just the Premier League, it gave UEFA, it also gave the Bundesliga and others the right to intervene into the market where no other business could do that as a cartel. And I think there's little or no regulation about that. Any other part of business in the European Union that operated as a cartel or was given that dispensation would have strong regulation on it, and it hasn't. And I think what's, but what we are seeing here is the operation of governing bodies who ostensibly come in into football association, to many sports, as well-meaning amateurs 
who haven't got the skill set to run big organisations. And I think this is one of the areas that now needs to be addressed in terms of governance and the question of the autonomy of that. And what is, how could you split that on regulation, the commercial and the bidding process? Because that is where I think the big international governing bodies is the fault line. It's between being a regulator, a commercial operation, and also running bids for, for big international organizations which are very wealthy. And it's that area that needs to be more transparent, more accountable, and I think you know, the issues around football, around cricket, around many others, and, and the Olympics as well, uh, is actually around that bidding process, and that's where the corruption starts to come in. The lines are blurred, it's very gray areas. And I think that is an area that needs to be looked at. But I do believe the commission themselves have got to look very carefully when they are giving dispensation to be able to operate cartels or other mechanisms with inside the market, where is the accountability? Because the market is not there to regulate anymore. Pero no debe exigir, eh, mi pregunta es hacia el señor Antonio, eh, una legislación única para todos los países de la Unión Europea, por ejemplo. Ahora mismo no lo hay en muchas materias. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we, I, I don't, personally, I don't believe that the solution is to have a regulation for that. Uh, this comes under the subsidiarity principle, means that this is under responsibility of member states. Member states have a responsibility to regulate, if they want, their own business. We have an issue at uh, the level of the European, uh, the European federations, the European associations, but I don't believe that we, 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 we could solve the problem by that way. If we regulate, we can immediately have to create a, uh, a, a service to, to inspect, to control. So we are creating here a new, uh, a new domain. So we believe that the, only, the, the, the best solution for that is to reinforce accountability. We ask organizations to be more accountable, to, to present a more, to, 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 to go further, as Richard was saying, on a transparent operating mode. They have to be transparent. They have to present all their accounts. And I, I don't think we have problems in all organizations. Uh, as you said, uh, are the, the, the sport organizations not much for that? I don't believe so. We have some issues. We have, today, we have a question of accountability. As we, as public servants, we are now asked to uh, be accountable for a number of things that we were not used in the past. So we have to adapt ourselves. And this is something that the, the, the sports organizations have to have. The other aspect is the corruption. The other aspect is related to uh, really mismanagement. But this enters into a different, comp uh, different uh, aspect. And we have also to distinguish between, as I said, the big organizations and the small ones. For the small ones, we have to, in some cases, to support them in a different way. And we are, and this is the role uh, uh, of this, uh, as I said, these expert groups that are pub trying to identify what are the best practices, what are the best way to implement the good principles of good governance. So this is uh, uh, the way we believe. And then asking the different organizations to commit themselves to make a sort, as I said, a, a self-declaration of their commitment. And this would create a pressure for the others. Those that are performing well would put uh, the standard very high and the others could follow or will be asked to follow, uh, to follow the example. So I believe that doing a regulation at European level will not be the panacea for, 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 for the problem, but having everybody on a more transparent, on a more democratic way of, uh, of dealing with the, the, the business. Sí, pero hay muchos ciudadanos que están eh, más pendientes de lo que ocurre en la FIFA que lo que ocurre en muchos ministerios de muchos países. Eh, no sé si de alguna manera el fútbol podría ser legislado o vigilado de otra manera distinta al resto de los deportes donde, bueno, quizá haya menos casos de corrupción, ¿no? Uh, ¿Por qué menos dinero? La pregunta es que tienes este tipo kind de of visibilidad porque la uh, uh, prensa pone esto en la agenda alta y el cantidad de dinero que está en camino es realmente ahí. But the, the, the way we believe that we can uh, push for a more transparent way is through a mechanism of transparency, 
uh, asking the organizations to publish the accounts if all the accounts will be published, if uh, all the different um, information are transparent. People will be ready to go and to see and to make a pressure for a change. So the change should, should be on, on that level, by the public opinion and not by a regulation manner. That's it. How serious are we in sport? If you look at the World Anti-Doping Agency and the code that it put into operation, first, that I got huge political support, as I said, and that's how I think we were able to bring around the code in a relatively short period of time. But how do you get that implemented then? And, and this is globally. And we're talking to some extent European, although there are colleagues from around the world, and I think we need to look in, the, in that context. Because as far as water is concerned, it was how do you actually implement a code worldwide? And first of all, the issue was, if you, like we said as ministers, if our governing bodies didn't sign up, they didn't get the money. Equally so, the Olympics were saying, anybody who didn't sign up, any of the sports that did not sign up to that water code could not perform at the Olympics. And I think that that's the criteria that you can start laying down. FIFA could do this. If FIFA is a reformed FIFA, it has standards it lays down, and any country that falls below those standards will not then be able to play in its competitions. Equally so as far as UEFA is concerned. If its standards are set, and there is acceptance, as it were, uni universally on that, then anybody that falls below those standards as a country or whatever will not be playing in those competitions. You have to have, I think, a stick and carrot. The carrot is that you want to play in our competitions. They're very lucrative, very prestigious. But if you don't come to the standards to qualify to get in that, and that's not just by scoring goals or whatever, it's actually by how you conduct yourself as a sport in that particular country. If you don't, you don't get into our competition. And financial fair play, to be quite honest, is using that to some extent, that type of... Uh, of issues that if you do not actually comply financially on financial fair play, then there are penalties to that. And I think we have to get sport to build in good governance, but also good surveillance, and then also to make sure that there's a penalty at the end of it if you do not comply. Eh, Miguel, aparte de si quieres añadir algo a este tema, eh, quería preguntarte eh, las amenazas que hay desde el deporte eh, en, aludiendo a las injerencias políticas. No son una especie de eh, atentado contra la soberanía de un país. No, no, no necesariamente, no. Yo señalaba antes que creo que hay casos en los que las organizaciones internacionales deportivas deben defender a sus asociaciones nacionales contra injerencias que puedan producirse en los estados. Pero creo que eso, para tener legitimidad, tiene que arrancar de la base de la que señalaba antes, que haya un compromiso de las organizaciones internacionales serio en este sentido, que se lo autoimpongan que lo que creo que es una realidad, que si no la reconocemos, insisto, estamos ciegos ante lo que está ocurriendo, que en el, prácticamente la totalidad de las organizaciones deportivas lo importante, lo primero en la agenda de sus dirigentes es mantener la, el, pos, el puesto que tienen y eso condiciona su relación con las asociaciones nacionales, con el resto de los stakeholders. Es muy difícil que en esas condiciones eh, se vaya a dar esto. Entonces, yo creo que el, el paso para el respeto de esta autonomía es exigir la coherencia con la misma, exigirles esas normas de democracia interna que hará que el control interno sea efectivo. Yo creo que los controles externos son siempre mucho más limitados. Es fácil engañar con una contabilidad. A mí me, me escandaliza más que cualquier cosa que pueda haber en el informe García. Lo que me escandaliza es que no tengan los ciudadanos de mi país, los cientos de miles de federados de fútbol, no tengan el informe García. Es algo inaudito en, la, en el sistema que tenemos de, 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 de valores en, en Europa y ahí estamos. ¿no? Entonces, ¿qué vamos a pedir? ¿Qué le va a pedir la FIFA a sus asociaciones nacionales? ¿Qué va a controlar de las confederaciones? Yo creo que el sistema es exigírselo, que se lo exijan ellos, que se acabe con todos esos sistemas clientelares de, de mantenimiento de los votos y que lo señalaba muy bien, en, lo señalabas en tu intervención, que para eh, admitir una asociación nacional se le exija que cumpla estos estándares de democracia interna. Porque yo de verdad soy un firme convencido de que el mejor y el más eficaz sistema de control es el propio sistema de control de los asociados de esa asociación. Y esa es la genuina eh, autonomía y esa es la autonomía 
insisto, que creo que los estados debemos defender y, por tanto, eh, en los términos en los que un, se produzca una injerencia que no sean estos, pues yo creo que es bueno también que, que los lo hagan. Y creo que los estados, además, estamos legitimados para pedirlo. Miren, eh, yo provengo, lo decías, del ámbito del derecho y, y las teorías sobre la autonomía de los ordenamientos antirromano en el ámbito más latino ponían de ejemplo al deporte y a la iglesia católica, ¿no? Nadie hubiera consentido en Europa Occidental, en muchos países, que se hubiera dicho que los problemas de pederastia se tenían que resolver conforme a la autonomía que tiene la Iglesia Católica. Y nadie duda que una confesión religiosa en un régimen de libertades tiene que ser autónomo. Por supuesto, autonomía, pero respetando los valores de las sociedades en las que estás implantado. Sí, pero el deporte tiene algún privilegio y es una cuestión para todos, de, para, ustedes, para ustedes tres. Eh, por ejemplo, en el, en el TAS, en el Tribunal de Arbitraje del Deporte, muchas veces se aplica un derecho que en el país no se puede aplicar. Y eso es un, entra en un conflicto realmente, por lo menos para el ciudadano que dice ¿cómo es posible que sancionen a determinado deportista si, si no podrían, de, 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 con, con el, nuestro derecho no podríamos sancionarle? No sé qué opinan al respecto. Yo creo que es un problema, que una tensión que siempre ha existido en el ámbito deportivo, porque el ámbito deportivo es universal y tiene que haber unas reglas universales y cada país es soberano para organizarse como quiera, pero creo que está, a mi modo de ver, relativamente bien resuelto y yo no veo tanto esas tensiones. Luego siempre tienes los tribunales de tu país, tenemos aquí en Europa el caso Pechstein, ahora eh, recientemente. O sea, que me parece que es un buen punto de equilibrio en el que el ámbito estrictamente jurídico se ha conseguido y se ha alcanzado. Okay. It's time for the floor. Uh, please uh, identify with the name and your organization, please. This man. Um, I'm going to respond in the way that Richard expected me to. Um, <laughs> oh, I suppose Richard, no, Nick, Nick Coward, until Monday, I was uh, General Secretary of the Premier League. I, uh, Richard and I have, I suppose, in many ways, agreed strongly on a wide range of issues over the last decade or more, and perhaps more often disagreed very strongly on, on issues. He's a politician. I run sports businesses. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with him this time. I'm just going to perhaps say that the comments he made prove to me why it is very dangerous to think the solution to this is having politicians involved in running sport. A lot of what he said in relation to um, his competition law analysis, put it this way, was, was not quite right. Um, sports bodies, of course, in the European Union are subject to competition law like, like any business, and we at the Premier League and other sports have got considerable experience of this. Anyway, I'm going to move on from that because I do think, I do think it just proves the point. Um, and I was actually going to turn it into a question. I, I can't remember how many of these events where politicians from European Union institutions, officials from European Union institutions, and from national governments have been here and talked about these issues with very little action, uh, I have to say. And the question was, are you in any way embarrassed that it was actually US institutions and their actions that led to the situation which we now see in many cases at FIFA and the considerable reform process that we're talking about. Uh, I, it, if that's uh, put to me, Nick, the, an, the, the answer is no. I'm, I'm very pleased. Not just you. No, no, well, fine. On the first point, uh, that Nick and I will disagree on that, and I, I, just, I just reflect on this one point, that you're in a very, yes, they do abide by the competition policy, But you have a cartel that's operating, that's been able to sell worldwide with little or no regulation on that. You tell me one other sector of industry that would get away with that without some type of regulation, and in many cases, statutory regulation. Because you are classed as a sport and not a business, that's the reason you got exemption. Not just the Premier League, UEFA, Bundesliga and the others. I just, I could, can't answer that. I can debate it with you a lot, but I won't. In terms of the whistleblower, uh, and that was the concept that was, I think, put by Ian this morning, and I think rightly so. 
And I think sport's been very resistant to anybody coming in. And I had that as a minister, I can tell you, and particularly from the sport that Nick and I have been involved in, that's football. The FA really, really pushed back on any non-executive directors or indeed any non-executive chairs. Bit by bit, that's coming. And I think that that is necessary. I think there are a number of mechanisms. I think bringing people from outside sport, I think as Ian and others were saying this morning, is very important and that will be good for sport. And I think also to make sure that that transparency and that accountability is there. Whistleblowing is very, very important. Peer group pressure and whistleblowers are absolutely fundamental to the policing of sport, in my view. And if you look at where all the major leaks have come through, or, or where all the issues have been raised, particularly around doping, it's come from people who are the whistleblower. And I think many countries have been able to put that into their regulatory framework as well. So I think there are a number of things that can be, can be actually put in place in good regulation. I go back to this point, that out there, and again it came out this morning, there is no template for what is good regulation in sport. And I think this is the debate that's taking place here, uh, is actually one of those issues that it ought to now be addressing, is how you put that global. The only one I know of any significance was the World Anti-Doping Agency, which has got a code that goes across all international, it's universal, it's international, it's global. I don't know of any other. Uh, we are over the time, so one more question. Ah, John, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. Well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm not a politician. I'm a civil servant uh, for, for all my career, and I do not want to be a politician. Uh, but uh, you said that we are working, we have been here a lot of times uh, without uh, uh, many, with many words and no action. We try to do what we can with the means that we have. And precisely in this case of good governance, we have put in place some expert groups that try to identify what are the good, the good principles. And we had last, uh, last period, the last, uh, uh, in 2014, we have come out with some good principles that now the expert groups, the people coming from member states, not for us, we have not the pretension to be experts on, 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 uh, on sport uh, activities. And we have not the pretension to run sport activities or sport organizations, not for us, it's not our business. Our business and according to the, to the, to the, the treaty and the, 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 the regulation we have is to try to support, to try to put all together different experts coming from the different, the, the different countries, different member states, the different entities, and to try to come out with some conclusions that can help organizations and sportive organizations to run better their business. And we are not only talking about big organizations, we are talking also about small organizations, because if we say 90% of, uh, of the sport entities are not the big ones, of course, we are not talking about big money. Big money is very small very small entities, very small organizations that are running that. But if we talk about the, 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 the organizations that are involving the, ma the massive people at European level are small ones. So and for those, it's very important to have some, some evidence, some instruments, some guidelines. And this is what we try to provide them. It's not to say, okay, it's like that that you have to do, and it's not our role, but together with uh, associations, with experts, we try to provide with some information that they can share and they can use. Thank you very quickly, please. Sí, yo muy brevemente, si me permites, aunque se acaba el tiempo, por eh, coincidir con lo, lo que señalabas, ¿no? por una parte, yo, yo sí comparto que la venta de, de los derechos de televisión sea centralizada y que el cártel es un cártel natural, porque la competición es un cártel, pero eh, junto a ello también me gustaría destacar que coincido con la otra aproximación que realizas. Una parte muy importante de la responsabilidad la tenemos los propios poderes públicos, que en muchas ocasiones hemos sido conniventes con estas organizaciones deportivas por el prestigio que te puede dar tener un acontecimiento de esta naturaleza, por rodearte de la atracción, sin duda, que delante de la gente, de tus votantes, tiene el deporte. Y, bueno, pues es una reflexión que indudablemente creo que era muy procedente también en esta mesa. Eh, podemos denunciar qué es lo que está pasando, pero también es imprescindible eh, tomar cuenta de qué es lo que hemos hecho los poderes públicos durante las últimas décadas con esta cuestión y creo que sería fácil convenir en los déficits que señalabas. Gracias. We are over the time, but last question. Here. Thank you. Uh, Matt King from the Department of Homeland Security. 
Um, Minister, you made a, uh, an observation that how, a question, how do you implement an international regime uh, and, and posited that, and if you don't meet these standards, you're out, you don't get to play in the competition. But I think there's a, another model uh, in Homeland Security, for instance, airport security, wherein there's a, uh, a whole layer of very efficient and safe airports and then less so uh, to ones that maybe you wouldn't want to use. Uh, and there are international standards, the ICAO, uh, civil aviation standards. So rather than saying this is a go, no go, you meet the standard or you don't, uh, various governments get together uh, or entities and build the capacity to meet the minimum standards wherein uh, you can continue to use this airport commercially and, and passengers. And, and you can ratchet up the uh, uh, sanctions uh, and, it, and it's very overt, it's transparent. So it's not permission uh, to continue to transgress, but rather an opportunity to bring up the game. And I'm, I'm wondering if that same model, and we do the same thing with ports and airports, et cetera, if we could use the same model for sport, that it's, it's not a carrot and a stick, but an opportunity to bring in a body, uh, an ICSS, for instance, so on, to be able to uh, give you best standards and then an opportunity to test those. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think capacity building in sport is, is, is crucial. And, and there's no doubt, if we're going to ask for standards, it's not going to happen overnight. And again, if you use the, uh, if you use the example of WADA, that was the case. We had to build up that capacity, and that was done, and I think now it's got to a reasonable level. And you're right. You, you, it's got to be proportionate, I think, is the word I would use there. Just 30 seconds, if I can go back to Nick, just to say to him... Politicians make decisions. Let me tell you, I keep politicians out of sport because they make the decisions. The civil servants who carry them out. Politicians don't carry, carry out the, 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 the laws that go into the statute book. And the farther you keep politicians away from running sport, I think the better. To support sport in achieving its objectives, I think they've got a crucial role to play. And just finally, I agree with collective selling of television, right, so they don't get anybody runs out of here or tweeting that Kevin doesn't agree with collecting. I do, but I think it needs to be properly regulated, and I think that all sport ought to benefit from that type of windfall that it receives. It's not at the moment. It ought to do. Miguel, Antonio, Richard, thank you very much. And now I invite you to follow this, this, this forum with the next panel about money laundering and tax evasion. Thank you very much. Gerardo, thank you very much. Uh, Can I get the mic, please?